So welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're having okay. Oh, well, greeting, greetings from uh, Melbourne, where I'm, I'm wearing this so I can put on a mask whenever necessary, which we have to do at all moments here. Uh, I should say by way of uh, introduction that uh, I'm not a group theorist. I work primarily in mathematical physics and algebraic combinatorics. And in algebraic combinatorics, it is very common that the sort of problems that we have, uh, that we're given um, some problem where we want to count some objects and we wish to establish the uh, asymptotic growth rate of the number of such objects as their size uh, grows with, with, some, with, with n, the number of edges or whatever, if it's a graph, for example. So that's how I came to the study of the amenability of Thomson's group, because one way of studying this is to look at the uh, associated combinatorial problem if we are trying to study or count the number of uh, returns to the uh, origin of the co-growth sequence on the Cayley graph. This is a typical graph counting problem um, that I've encountered many times. So that was really the uh, approach that, that has been taken here. Um, however, because we don't know what the asymptotics are, apart from the fact that there's exponential growth, it seemed appropriate to make this a broader study and look at a range of other finitely presented infinite groups to determine how their asymptotics behave and to what extent we could extract those asymptotics. Um, this is uh, joint work with Andrew L. V. Price, who was at the time my PhD student and is currently a postdoc in France. Oh, my next problem is that uh, while I can, ah, there we go. I have to, it seems like I have to use the mouse to, yes, I, my toggling the keyboard doesn't work. I have to uh, swipe with the mouse, which is a strange thing to do. So, okay, infinite, finitely generated groups, or this is all going to be very familiar with you, that my first example is the group Z2 with the operation of addition, generated by um, a step to the right or a step up. Free group on two generators, F2, and an example, uh, a non-example rather, an example of a group that isn't the infinite finitely generated group is uh, the group of rational numbers with the operation of addition, which is of course not finitely generated. So a Cayley graph of a group, given a group G with a finite generating set S, the Cayley graph gamma uh, is defined such that we associate a vertex with each element of the group. And there is an edge between two vertices for each pair G and S, where G is in the group and uh, S is, uh, one of the, is one of the generating sets. So, the first picture is the Cayley graph of Z2. Second picture is the Cayley graph of A4. Third picture is the Cayley graph of F2, the free group on two generators. So the co-growth sequence, if we have a group G with generating set S and Cayley graph gamma, the co-growth sequence is just a sequence of, uh, of integers defined as follows. For each n, we let L sub n be the number of walks of length 2n in uh, the Cayley graph, which start and end at the root vertex. So this is what I said at the beginning. We're just counting the number of returns to the origin, essentially. Equivalently, if you prefer a grammatical interpretation, it's the number of words W of length 2n over the alphabet S U S inverse, which are equal to the identity. I guess if anyone wants to ask a question, they should wave their arms, except I can't hear you. So I guess <laughs> this is great. No, nobody can ask a question. Um, okay. So a group G 
is, or I guess you, if, you, if you really have a question, wave your arms and hold it up on a piece of paper. Murray seems to be scribbling something there. Question, yes. <laughs> right. Okay. A group uh, is amenable if any of the following equivalent conditions hold. Only, I'm going to give you three equivalent conditions. Only the last one means anything to me. The first one says there exists a left invariant finitely additive probability measure on G. There's some definition which involves something called Follner sets, which I know nothing about. And uh, the enumerative uh, definition is that the co-growth sequence satisfies the fact that uh, the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth root is four times the square of the number of generators. In this case, we will be looking at uh, groups with uh, two generators, in, not always, but uh, when we took, talk about uh, Thompson's group, so that limit should be 16. And perhaps surprisingly, this uh, limit does not depend on the choice of Cayley graph. So let's look at a couple of examples, some simple, some less simple. First, the co-growth of uh, Z2. The Cayley graph for Z2 is of course the square lattice. The number of returns to the origin, which is the co-growth sequence, is just given by the square of the binomial coefficient 2n choose n. This is just the number of loops of length 2n on the square lattice and therefore it follows that z2 is amenable because if we take the uh, nth root of ln we get 16 in the limit as n goes to infinity. Um, another example, the Cayley graph for f2, the free group on two generators, is the infinite uh, four regular tree the co-growth sequence is given by the algebraic generating function I've just shown on the screen. And the growth, um, radio, uh, the growth constant is 12. And so F2 is not amenable because 12 is less than 16. Um, there's a famous von Neumann conjecture, which is I think how Thompson came to uh, develop uh, his group F. The von Neumann conjecture states that a finitely generated group is non-amenable if and only if it contains F2 as a subgroup. The if direction is easy to prove, but the other direction is in fact false. And if you're interested in counterexamples, Google the loader more groups, which are examples that uh, give you false proof. Thompson's group F is a group on two generators defined by the algebraic relations, two algebraic relations shown there. A couple of interesting facts. It doesn't contain F2 as a subgroup. And so when Thomson proposed it, uh, he thought that it might uh, be used as a um, proof of the, or this proof of what the von Neumann conjecture. Um, it might not be amenable. Indeed, what I hope to convince you of today is that it isn't amenable. And that's, that's really the big question. Is Thompson's group F amenable? Um, the group was introduced by Richard Thompson in 1967, hoping that it was non-amenable. Since then, it would disprove the von Neumann conjecture. Nobody was able to prove that it was non-amenable. And However, in 1980, Olshansky disproved the von Neumann conjecture anyway. But the interest in the amenability of Thomson's group continued. In 2009, Akhmedov announced a proof that Thomson's group is not amenable. Later that year, he withdrew the claim because he found an error in the proof. Still later that year, Moore proved that if Thomson's group is amenable, the Follner sets have to grow extremely quickly. In 2010, Shav Gwilidzi announced the proof that Thompson's group is amenable. In 2011, Moore pointed out that this method is hopeless because the Follner sets wouldn't grow extremely quickly. However, Moore then announced a proof in 2012 that Thompson's group is amenable. Later that year, he retracted his proof because he found it was wrong. In 2014, Wayne Ribb and Wittowitz announced a proof that Thompson's group is not amenable, and the following year they retracted their proof. 
So you can see there's a long and checkered history of uh, incorrect proofs, fortunately, mostly retracted by the people who proposed them. So our plan to determine whether F is amenable, though of course we're not claiming to be proving this, is that we know that Thomson's group is amenable if and only if its co-growth sequence has exponential growth rate 16. So our plan initially was to try and find a recursive formula for the co-growth sequence and analyze the asymptotics. Unfortunately, this was unsuccessful. We couldn't find a recursive formula. So we fell back on the idea of generating as many coefficients as possible in the co-growth sequence and try and use a variety of well-established techniques to determine uh, what the co-growth sequence is from these available coefficients. Um, so firstly, uh, there, I should say that there was in existence some uh, terms in the co-growth sequence, but we wanted as many as possible. So the first thing that we did was to try and push the uh, series a bit further, get some more coefficients. And Andrew L. V. Price, as part of his PhD, uh, was able to modify an existing algorithm to get some more terms by making the algorithm more efficient. So I'll give you a very brief outline of the algorithm. So for each uh, group element, we let P subscript G comma N be the number of paths of length N from the uh, identity vertex to the vertex new G. Then if we square this, whoops, if we square this quantity PG sub N, that's simply the number of loops of length 2N whose midpoint is new G. And so uh, we can find the coefficient Tn by summing this Pgn squared uh, over all the group elements. And we can calculate Pgn recursively because Pgn um, is obtained from Pgn minus one by the four group elements, A, A inverse and B, B inverse. Unfortunately, the number of group elements G with Pgn greater than zero grows exponentially as about 2.618 to the n. So this algorithm takes a lot of memory, which is what caused us earlier. There is a less intensive uh, version, a memory less intensive version. The idea being that we only have to calculate the values of P in memory up to uh, size n over two using a recursive formula to calculate the PGNs themselves. And the advantage of this, it only takes uh, order square root of the uh, memory size of the original algorithm. Unfortunately, it doesn't save any time, uh, but we were previously limited by memory. And using this improved algorithm, we calculated uh, 32 terms, which took about a month running on 60 cores on the high performance cluster at the university. Uh, am I going, is this okay, the pace I'm going at? Okay. Now I want to take a brief um, diversion and introduce something completely different because it gives us uh, another property of um, co-growth sequences of infinite finitely uh, presented groups. I want to talk about the Hausdorff moment problem very generally and related to uh, Thomson's group F in just a moment. So the idea is that certain combinatorial problems, if you look at the coefficients, in this case, in Thomson's group, it's the coefficients Tn that we, we've just enumerated, you can express them as the moments of some measure. So there's the representation, as the, how's, uh, here's the coefficient Cn, and it is given by the integral from A to B of x to the n mu x dx for some measure mu. If you can do this, and you obviously can't always do it, but if you can do this, then 
Firstly, the measure is unique as long as the uh, support AB is finite. And the so-called Stilchus transform of this measure phi is just given by the sum of a bunch of simple poles. And such a sum is, if you, uh, add, if you were to just calculate this for some finite value, uh, you would just get the ratio of two polynomials uh, of degree n minus one in the numerator and n in the denominator, which is in fact the n minus one n part a approximant. And this converges to the Stilchus transform. So this gives you a um, monotone sequence of convergence uh, to the uh, Stilchus transform S. Why is this interesting? It's interesting because the denominator zeros that you have so constructed give you rigorous bounds on the support AB. Now such a measure exists if the so-called Hankel determinants are all non-negative and the Hankel determinants are just these, um, the, these square matrices that you can calculate up to as many coefficients as you have. As long as they're non-negative, um, then uh, you have a Hausdorff moment problem. Now, most combinatorial sequences can't be expressed as a Hausdorff moment problem because of this stringent condition. But when it's satisfied, it actually buys you quite a lot because of this uh, property that the denominator zeros of the Pardé approximants provide rigorous bounds. And in fact, Hagerup, Hagerup and Ramirez Solano in a paper two or three years ago proved that the co-growth sequence for Thomson's group F is the moment sequence of a probability measure. And as Andrew was able to show, in fact, their proof applies to the co-growth sequence of any locally finite Cayley graph. And we've extended this to apply, in fact, to any locally finite graph. What this means is that if you simply take the coefficients of Thomson's group F that uh, we've generated, you immediately get the lower bound, 13.269, and then subject to some plausible but unproved additional condition, we can improve this lower bound to 13.706. Now this is nice, it gives you a better bound, but of course, we would like an upper bound that's less than 16, a lower bound isn't going to tell you anything about amina B, but at least it's telling you something uh, about the, the growth constant. And it's going to give us another route to study what that uh, growth constant is in the case of Thomson's group, because what we have is a monotone increasing sequence of lower bounds by this method, and these can be extrapolated. And if we extrapolate them, we get uh, an estimate of the uh, radio, of, of the growth constant for Thomson's group, which turns out to be indistinguishable from 15, which you will agree is lower than 16. Um, and I'll come to that much later. Okay, so that, that, that's going to be the first method that we use to study the amenability, which is extrapolating these bounds. Um, before I go on to consider a whole range of other um, infinite, finitely presented groups, I want to uh, sh show you, because this is probably completely unfamiliar to you, how, given a finite bunch of terms, we can estimate the uh, growth constant or radius of convergence. So this is what I call series analysis 101. You're given some function where you know the coefficient Cn up to some finite value. Um, we know, of course, from the cauchy hadamard theorem that the radius of convergence, which is the reciprocal of the growth constant, is given by 1 over lim sup Cn to the 1 over n. And this is a nice result because it gives us a sequence of bounds because of the limb sup. Uh, alternatively, the ratio test tells us that if we simply take the ratio of successive coefficients, that too will give us the radius of convergence. In fact, using the, radi uh, the ratio of coefficients is usually a much more precise way 
of estimating the radius of convergence than using the cauchy hadamard theorem for the following reason. The most common sort of um, singularity that we get in combinatorial problems is just a simple power law. That is, you've got a one minus Z over ZC with a, some exponent gamma. In that case, the coefficients asymptotically are given by one over ZC, which is the growth constant raised to the power N times N to the gamma minus one. And if you accept this as the asymptotic behavior of such a function and calculate the um, nth root of the absolute value of the coefficient, you'll see that firstly, you've got a constant that's independent and you've got a radius of convergence one over ZC multiplied by this independent constant um, and you've got this factor log n over n. If on the other hand, you look at the ratios, it's much cleaner. You've got one over ZC and one plus gamma minus one over n. So what this means is if we were to plot the ratios against one over n, assuming you can neglect higher order terms, you should get a straight line with um, gradient gamma minus one over ZC and intercept one over ZC. So here I'm showing you with this test series, e to the minus Z, one minus pi Z to the two thirds, the um, nth roots of the coefficients and the ratios of the coefficients. You can see that the ratios of the coefficients using terms from, I think from 06, this is about point of, Five, something like uh, 24 to 100, you're going from 2.8 to 3.09. This is, this is pi up here, which is where it should go to. Whereas if you look at the uh, nth roots, firstly, I don't know how visible this is, but this is concave downwards, whereas this is absolutely straight. And the, the, uh, values go from about 2.1 up to 2.9 compared to these which go from 2.8 up to 3.1. So we're getting much closer if we use the ratios to, to, the, um, to the limit. So the, the study of ratios is extremely, uh, often extremely revealing. Second, which more precise, when we have nice simple Palo singularities is a method called the method of differential approximants. The idea here is that you take your coefficients and force them to fit a differential, a differential equation, a linear differential equation with polynomial coefficients. This is one of the simplest examples, second order linear DE, Q2, Q1, Q0 and P, are polynomials and you just vary the degrees of these polynomials uh, until you uh, run out of known coefficients um, that be higher and higher degree and each time you will generate a differential equation from this differential equation you can analyze it for its singular behavior so this is a simple example with a second order differential equation in general we play with a uh, an mth order differential equation where we take the uh, derivatives, multiply them by a polynomial. Then the singularities are approximated by the zeros of Q2 in this case, or QM in the general case. And the exponents, assuming we're looking at a nice uh, power law singularity, follow from the additional initial equation and if there's only a single root, there's no double roots, then these can be uh, evaluated by looking at the uh, values of the uh, polynomials Q M and Q M minus one evaluated at the uh, zeros of these polynomials. The beauty of this method, unlike the ratio method, is that it can give you extraordinary accuracy. Here's an example. We applied, this is an example, applying this method to 
counting self-avoiding polygons, which is an unsolved problem. And this is a second order differential equation. This is a third order differential equation. This is an estimate of the square of the radius of convergence. And this is an estimate of the exponent. And you can see that you're getting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All these uh, differential approximants are agreeing to, uh, to nine digits and only a little bit of variation in the 10th digit. And similarly, the exponent uh, is 1.5. Oh, 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 oh. It wouldn't take a, a super optimist to estimate that this should be three over two exactly. Unfortunately, not all series behave as nicely as this. This is a beautiful power law singularity. And if the Thomson's group F behaved as nicely as this, I think there'd be no doubt um, that we'd be able to um, very uh, confidently conjecture its asymptotic behavior. However, we can't and we are um, reliant really on the ratio method and variance of it, which I will shortly demonstrate to extract that information. There's one other method that I have to show you, which is absolutely essential to this study. And um, I'm glad that uh, I can't hear you because you probably say this sounds like absolute nonsense. Uh, and indeed, when I developed this method uh, and published it, people said that it was absolute nonsense. Um, well, not they weren't quite that rude, but they expressed some reservations, but everyone who's tried it and every example I've used it on shows that it works uh, and it's, it's, it's astonishing. The idea is the following. I've shown you that what we do with these, with the method of differential approximants is to find a differential equation that the coefficients that you have satisfy. Now, of course, once you've found a differential equation, that differential equation um, can generate all the coefficients that you use to, to derive it, but it also implies all the rest of the coefficients. And these, of course, will not be, unless you've stumbled upon the exact differential equation, these will not be accurate. Uh, these will not be, sorry, these will not be the exact coefficients, but they will be some sort of approximation, one hopes. And so the idea is um, that we generate many such differential approximants using the available coefficients and look at the coefficients that they imply for all the unknown coefficients and keep going beyond the limits of the known coefficients and simply take, simply do, do a simple statistical analysis, take the, uh, the mean of the coefficients that we conjecture from the various differential approximants that we've used, take the standard deviation of that around that mean, use that as an estimate of the error and take those approximate terms which can then be used in the ratio method to extend ratios. And what we found is that in some cases, um, let's, well, in one, the, the first example, the, the most successful example I had uh, was a problem where we were able to generate 100 coefficients exactly. I found that I could generate the next 1,000 coefficients using this method with an accuracy determined by the standard deviation of better than 10 significant digits. And nobody, but well, not I'd say nobody believed this, but a number of people I showed this to politely expressed reservations. We then subsequently solved the problem, generated the thousand terms exactly, and indeed they were correct to the predicted accuracy. And this has happened time and time again. Uh, we've predicted a large number of terms. We've eventually either generated a large number of terms or the problem has been solved. And in every case, the predicted number of terms have been correct to the predicted accuracy. So this is going to be essential to our uh, study because we really worked hard to get our 32 terms, but we need significantly more terms to high enough precision 
to use the ratio method and we can get these by the method of series extension. And as I say, the idea is simply to use the method of differential approximants to predict subsequent ratios. Every differential approximant, as I say, naturally reproduces exactly all coefficients used in its derivation and being a definite differential equation that implies the value of all subsequent coefficients, which of course will be approximate. The first predicted coefficient will be the most accurate with accuracy declining with increasing order of predicted coefficients. And in practice, as I say, we construct many differential approximants, calculate the average of the predicted coefficients across all the constructed approximants, as well as their standard deviation. And we've experimentally found the true error to be between one and two standard deviations and the number of terms we can predict varies from problem to problem. Um, what we will find in Thompson's group is that with the 32 known coefficients, we can predict about, we can uh, predict another 150. So we end up with in fact about 180 effective coefficients for our ratio study. So what we're going to do is use these to determine if Thompson's group is amenable. To that end, we're going to study the asymptotics of some other amenable groups, develop techniques to deal with all known behavior, and recall that if Thompson's group F is amenable, it is only just amenable. Um, if the growth constant of the co-growth series, question? <laughs> oh yeah, the question, question is, how, does that oh, hang on, how do I work in the series if it's not definite? Question in chat, how do I get to chat? Um, participants, stop. <laughs> all I'm seeing on my screen is, is you guys. Um, okay, this could be a disaster, Murray. Uh, part, I'll go back to participants. Um, no, participants, stop video, mute, new share, pause, share, annotate, remote control, more. Chat, ah, chat. Hold on a second, I'll introduce you. Murray, yes, yes, but Murray is back. Oh, does that method's accuracy still work if the series is not definite? Absolutely. Um, if the series is definite, the method will usually find it or get better and better. Um, I mean, I don't believe Thompson's group is definite. Oh, no, I, it, it's principal value is for non-definite series. For definite series, the method of differential approximants itself provides beautiful beautiful results. This, this, this is for um, shitty series that we can't do much with otherwise. Um, okay, recall that if Thompson's group is a mean, uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and uh, yes, for those of you who'd rather be looking at your mobile phones for the rest of the talk, uh, to summarize, we're going to find that the growth constant is indistinguishable from 15, which would imply quite clearly that the group is not amenable. And we find that value 15 from several different approaches. So um, here is, here, here is a, uh, an actual theorem, unlike all the numerical mumbo jumbo that I'm talking about, which is I think really useful, which Andrew proved as part of his PhD. Um, We've, I've got the royal we here, but it's actually Andrew proved a theorem which implies that if F is amenable, then its co-growth sequence grows remarkably slowly. Here's the theorem. Let CN be the number of loops of length 2N in the standard Cayley graph for Thomson's group. Then for any real numbers A less than one and kappa less than one, the inequality CN is less than 16 to the N, kappa to the N to the alpha, holds for sufficiently large integers n. Now that, that requires a little bit of thinking about what that actually means. Re okay, if kappa is less than one for a start, which is part of the statement of the theorem, then the smaller the value of a is, of course, the larger is kappa to the end of the alpha for fixed n. We're saying, 
uh, that if alpha is less than one, CN is less than 16 to the N kappa to the N to the alpha. So if alpha is equal to one, so A, I'm, I should say A, not alpha. If A is equal to one, then we've got kappa to the N there and we've got 16 to the N. So that means we're talking 16 kappa to the N, which means we're modifying the growth constant. So we can't have A equal to one, but A can't also be less than one, according to the theorem. So what can happen is that A is numerically equal to one, but not just, it's not just kappa to the n, so rather we could have something like kappa to the n divided by log n. Then that doesn't modify the 16, but it still satisfies the theorem. So essentially what this is saying, that C, if Cn, uh, if, sorry, <coughs> if, um, We've, we have 16 to the n as the limit, then the subdominant term has to be something like kappa to the n over log n. Uh, the proof of this results follows from re some results of Pitte and Salof Coste, who showed that the number of random walks that contribute to the Cayley graph of the general wreath product, where we take z with z d times, suitably bracketed, grows in a particular manner, which is too complicated to write down now. And since this WD is a subgroup of Thomson's group F, this growth that they showed applies to F. And then with some straightforward analysis, um, the theorem follows. I'll give you a reference later if you want to look at the details. So this theorem is another way of um, showing that Thomson's group is not amenable, and I, because we'll show that in fact Thomson's these coefficients do appear to be behaving with this kappa to the end of the alpha behavior with a less than one and kappa less than one, which is in violation of this theorem. But that'll come later. So let me just show you some examples of some simple uh, infinite finitely generated groups with increasing complexity in their asymptotics. The simplest group that we're starting with is the group Z2, which we've seen before. The coefficients are just 2n choose n squared, behaves asymptotically like 16 to the n over n pi. Then we look at the Heisenberg group, which behaves like 16 to the n over 2 2n squared, where we have one of these kappa to the end of the alpha, so-called stretched exponential terms, as well as a subdominant end of the one sixth. The wreath product of z with itself, there we have an even more complicated stretched exponential with an end of the sigma log n to the delta. Uh, if time permits, I'll discuss the Navis Brin group B, for which nothing is known about the subdominant behavior, except it's known to be amenable. So it grows like 16 to the n and by the theorem, it must grow more slowly than this. And we're going to suggest in fact that the behavior is as shown there. And then finally, we'll look at Thomson's group F. If uh, So I might have to skip something, but let me show you initially for the group Z2, the coefficients of the co-growth series uh, just as shown there. The ratio of successive coefficients, these are the ratios that I discussed before, behave as shown. So if we plot these ratios of say the first 50 coefficients against one over n, I'll show you on the next slide, the expected limit of 16 is pretty obvious. The exponent should be minus one and which corresponds to a logarithmic singularity of the generating function, which behaves like log one minus 16 X. And if you apply this, the method of differential approximants to this problem, you'll in fact find that you find the correct 
differential equation from the first 20 or so coefficients. So you find the exact differential equation, which you can then solve by classical methods to show that the uh, generating function is given by 2k 4 root x over pi, where k is the complete elliptic integral of the first kind. So here are the ratio plots that I promised you. These are just the ratios of successive coefficients, whoops, going to 16. And these are estimators of the exponent by calculating the gradient from successive terms. And you can see going to the value minus one, uh, which is the appropriate uh, exponent. So this is a nice example of the ratio method for a nice, simple, clean power law singularity. And it works beautifully as does the method of differential approximants. Um, Heisenberg group, a little bit more complicated. The asymptotic behavior of the generating function is as shown here, one minus 16 X log one minus 16 X. The ratio based on the first 90 coefficients is shown here, going nicely linearly to 16. And here's estimators of the exponent, which are also going not quite linearly, but not much curvature and it's straightening out, but very plausibly going to minus two, which is the uh, appropriate power. Um, you can use the ratio method to calculate uh, higher order terms in the asymptotics because if you having shown that uh, the dominant behavior is uh, 16 to the n over 2n squared, you can divide that out. And you, what you're left with, you can analyze by the ratio method. And if you do that, you will find that uh, you'll get an exponent of two, which suggests that the um, subdominant term is of order one over n squared and you do it again and the sub sub dominant term is of order one over n cubed. So this is absolutely consistent with a power law singularity of the generating function. And so one way to handle this is to uh, simply fit to this polynomial in higher order powers of n and take three successive coefficients say and use those as estimators of K1, K2 and K3, simply solving the linear system as you let M range from 20 up to 89, at which time we've run out of coefficients. And if you do that, you obtain estimates of the amplitudes K1, K2, K3, which you can then extrapolate against appropriate powers of one over M. And in that way, we found, uh, ah, we find the I, I don't think um, has been uh, ever written down. I mean, it's, I, you could do a lot better job. We only took 90 terms. We can, you, there are more terms available. But I just did this to show you how powerful the ratio method can be uh, in these nice, simple cases. You can uh, extract quite a lot of, by way of asymptotics. The next example, which is a little bit more complicated, is the lamplighter group, which is the wreath product of the group of order two with the generators, with the integers rather. And then for this group, you've got this additional rather nasty kappa to the end of the one third term. Now this means that uh, you're, you're not going to be definite, um, so that your um, method of differential approximants is not going to give you very good results. So we're pretty much restricted to the ratio method, though the method of differential approximants can still be used to extend the series. As I say, the presence of this stretched exponential term makes the analysis more difficult. We generated 201 terms of the co-growth series. And if you have the, this asymptotic behavior, and you calculate the ratio of successive coefficients. I've changed CN to AN for no valid reason here, um, but I've kept the notation sigma and kappa. So we've got kappa to the end of the sigma, and it's this that messes things up. So the ratios, remember, if we didn't have this kappa here, if we just had this end of the G, 
oops, sorry, then the ratio would be mu into one plus G over N. Because of this kappa to the end of the sigma, we've got this uh, term sigma log kappa over end of the one minus sigma, and the sigma lies between zero and one, this end of the one minus sigma is um, a higher order term than G over N. And what this means is that experimentally, let's say you didn't even know you had such a term, if you uh, were given such a sequence, you would find firstly that the differential approximants were rather erratic. You couldn't get a clear idea of the critical of the growth constant or the exponent. And the ratio plots are curved. The reason the ratio plots are curved, of course, is that you're plotting something that goes like one over n to the one minus sigma against one over n, which is not going to be linear. And the idea is experimentally, you can largely eliminate that curvature by trying a few values of sigma. You know sigma lies between zero and one, so you try sigma as a half and see if the curvature it, what, what effect that has. It might have changed the curvature from concave to convex. So the idea is you just play games, run sigma through a few values. It's the, the method's not terribly sensitive. The, this criterion is not terribly sensitive. You can probably pick get sigma to within 0.1 or 0.2. That is, you've got, you've got two competing terms in the ratios, one of order one over n, to the one minus sigma and the other of order one over n, but you can eliminate the order one over n term by calculating modified ratios, simply multiplying Rn by n, Rn minus one by n minus one and subtract them. And that kills the term of order one over n and modifies slightly the amplitude of the, this term. So here's an example, uh, if you, um, calculate these modified ratios against one over n to the two thirds, in the case of the lamplighter group, you get a beautiful straight line going towards nine, which is the uh, correct uh, growth constant. Um, and you can, um, the other thing you can do, you can, um, if you didn't know what sigma was, you can uh, calculate these, uh, rearranging this Rn divided by mu, take away one, uh, plot that against log n, it should be linear with gradient sigma minus one. And in that way, you get a pretty good estimate that sigma is a third. So once you've got mu and sigma, you can estimate the remaining parameters by direct fitting, just as we did with the Heisenberg group. That is to say, we know that the coefficients behave nine to the n, kappa to the n to the one third, n to the g, take logs, you get this expression with mu and sigma now. So there's mu incorporated, there's sigma incorporated, and kappa and g and c are um, not known. But you can take groups of, as we did with the analysis of the Heisenberg group coefficients, take successive triples, get estimates of the three unknowns, log kappa, g and log c. And in this way, we estimate uh, log kappa g and log c with those values shown there. If we use the fact that we know that uh, g is exactly one sixth, uh, we can get refined estimates of the remaining parameters, giving us uh, an extra digit or two in the estimate of log kappa and uh, a, a slight improvement in our estimate of log c. And as far as we're aware, those constants have not previously been estimated. Um, and a more complicated example still is the wreath product of Z with itself. There we've got kappa to the end of the sigma log n to the delta uh, with sigma is one third and delta is two thirds. In that case, the ratio behaves in this hot, rather horrible manner. You've got a term of order log n to the delta on n to the one minus sigma. You've got a term log n to the delta minus one over n to the one minus sigma, and you've got your g over n. We generated this series to order 276. A plot is strongly concave. 
plotting against one over n to the two thirds is much closer to linearity, but still slightly concave. Once again, we eliminate the term of order one over n, and then we get by forming these modified ratios, n r n minus n minus one r n minus one, and then we get this horrible looking thing here, but we've got a term of order n to the two thirds, and a term, a little o, n to the minus five thirds, uh, and you've got this, this thing here. And if we plot the modified ratios against this term, you can see it's absolutely beautifully linear and going to 16. If you simply plot the modified ratios against one over n to the two thirds, it's, it's got some curvature. I don't know how easily you can see that. I don't know if you can see what I'm doing here, but uh, it's concave downwards. And uh, this one is, uh, is completely linear. Um, so in that way, we've estimated the uh, two thirds. Um, and we can go on, and I've cut that out because it starts to get a bit boring and technical, but you can go on and estimate delta, the other exponent and other, other things as well. Um, I'll, I'll go over this very quickly because I want to devote some minutes to Thompson's group, which is what this is all about. There's a group proposed independently by Navis and Brin, uh, which is a subgroup of Thompson's group F. It's an infinite wreath product with an extra generator conjugating each generator of the wreath product to the next one. Because there are two generators, the growth rate of the co-growth sequence is 16. It also has sub -exponential, a sub-exponential growth term that is very close to exponential and so makes the growth rate difficult to estimate. That is to say, it behaves in exactly the way that uh, I indicated Thompson's group would have to behave by virtue of the theorem that I showed you earlier. That is, you'd need a term something like kappa to the n over log n. We generated 128 terms exactly, used the method of series extension to predict the next 590 ratios, the last of which we expect to be accurate, as I say, to one part in five by 10 to the seven. The asymptotic form of the coefficients is not known, so no one can tell us our results are wrong because nobody knows how it should behave. They must grow by virtue of our th the theorem more slowly than C times 16 to the N, kappa to the end of the sigma. One possible behavior, as I indicated earlier, involves this kappa to the N over log N. In that case, the ratios would behave like this, 16 one plus constant over log N. We don't insist that the first correction be order one over log N, it could be a power of a logarithm for our purposes, because one over log n is so different from one over n, it suffices to take this term to be one over log n. If we only had our 128 terms, the ratios against one over log n, this is what they look like. And it's a giant leap of faith to say that this is going to a limit of 16. You'd have to, well, the only way you could say that is if you knew it were true, which we do. Um, but with 718 ratios, which involve using the extra ratios from our uh, method of series extension, you can see that this limit of 16 is much more plausible. Anyway, um, we messed around for a bit. We, we estimated sigma, which should be minus one, should be one, I beg your pardon, um, without assuming mu equals 16. Again, if we only have 128 terms, this is our estimate of sigma minus two. Sigma, recall, should be one. Sigma minus two should be minus one. And anybody who says that that's going to minus one uh, is, is a, well, is, is, I don't know what. You'd say they were mad uh, because it looks like it's going to something positive. But if you take all our extra terms, you can see that's what actually happening is that they're turning over. And this is much more, it's much more plausible that this is going to a limit of minus one. Uh, and so in, in this way, we've, we've analyzed uh, the, the, the navis brin group just to show that, that we can even um, handle such bizarre behavior. Now we get to what we really, what you wanted to hear about, Thompson's group. Um, 
we used fourth order differential approximants. We got 200 further ratios, which give us an, with an error of less than one part in four by 10 to the fifth, which by graphical means is imperceptible. And now these two curves are very significant. So first we plot the ratios against one over N. That is not linear. So it's, we don't, that, that is our strong indication that we don't have a simple power law singularity. It's concave downwards. If we plot against one over N to the one fifth, it's concave upwards. That suggests the presence of a stretched exponential term with an exponent somewhere between uh, zero and four fifths. Remember, this goes like n to the one minus sigma. If you have such a term present, then the group is not amenable by the theorem. So that's our first very powerful piece of evidence that it's not amenable. Uh, I say there's a strong evidence for the presence of a conventional stretched exponential term of the sort we've seen in our study of the lamplighter group and the wreath product groups. The presence of such a term is incompatible with amenability. And note too that this is quite different to the behavior observed for the coefficients of the Navis Brin group B, which is a just amenable group. We now assume then that we have a stretched exponential term and see if we can analyze the coefficients. So if we look for the value of sigma, this should be, this is a graph of sigma minus two. It looks like it's going to something like minus 1.5, which would suggest that sigma is round about 0 0.5. And this one is an estimate of minus delta, which also appears to be going to something like minus 0 0.5. So using our ex extended ratios, we get these quite clear signals of the values of sigma uh, and delta. Um, Okay, if that is the value of sigma, ratio plots against one over root n, and indeed uh, should not be linear, but against root log n over n should be. And here's the plot against root log n over n, and it's pretty close to linear and going to 15. Uh, so in this way, we estimated the uh, growth constant to be somewhere between 14.8 to 15.1 based on the first 186 modified ratios. So that's analyzing the series directly to determine the radius of convergence or growth constant. There's another way that we develop, which makes use of the fact that we know the growth constants of the lamplighter group and the wreath product of Z with itself. So for example, we know that the lamplighter group ratios behave like this because we have the exact results. For the wreath product of Z with itself, we know that the rate behave like this. For wreath product, Z, wreath, Z, wreath, Z, the ratios behave like this. For Thompson's group, all we know is that the ratios behave like mu into one plus lower order terms. So a simple test for amenability is to look at these uh, three coefficients. If we take, um, because this is nine, if we take this as nine over 16 times the ratio of the Thomson group ratios to the lamplighter group ratios, or the ratio of the Thomson group ratios to the wreath product ratios, or the ratio of the triple wreath product to the Thomson group ratios, all these ratios should go to one if Rn, if Thomson's group uh, is amenable, that is, if mu is 16. So if Thomson's group F is amenable, these coefficient, these ratios should all go to one. And here they all are. There's the first one. It seems to be going to somewhere between, this is, I don't know if you can read it, 0 0.9, 0 0.92, 0 0.93. This is the um, Z wreath Z. It's a bit inconclusive, but, this is a fairly narrow range from 903 to 918. And again, we argue, well, I mean, who knows where it's going to go, but it's, it's, it's quite plausible. That also goes to something like 9293. And finally, this is the um, 
ratio against the triple wreath product. This is pretty close to linear and it's definitely, it, you know, it'd have to do something like that to get to one. It's again going to 0.93. So all of my point is that uh, all of these are consistent with a limit of around 0.93 plus or minus 0.02 corresponding to a growth constant for Thomson's group of 14.9 plus or minus 0.3. Um, the other thing we can do, as I mentioned at the beginning, is extrapolate the lower, rigorous lower bounds that we got from um, our uh, moment series analysis, which are bounds on the square root of mu. This extrapolates to 3.875, from which it follows that mu is about 15. So in conclusion, we found everything we do suggests that the growth constant for Thomson's group F is very close to 15 by a variety of methods. And consequently, we confidently conjecture that the group is not amenable. With lower confidence, we suggest that the coefficients behave in fact with a stretched exponential term where mu is about 15, kappa takes a value approximately one over E, sigma and delta around a half, and G is minus one. We've also proved a theorem about the growth rate that may provide an alternative route to the proof of non-amenability. Uh, for further details, you can see our paper in the Journal of Algebra, International Journal of Algebra and Computing, uh, or alternatively, a cheaper version is on the archives. Thanks very much.